We've moved from the real world, where context and intention really matter in pragmatics, through semantics of which we entered the rarefied world of generative linguistics, down to syntax of which meaning disappeared and all was structure, and morphology, where even the structure of the word seemed to go away. Now we're going to go one level deeper, still within the generative frame, and discuss the organization of sounds within a language, a language understood now as a code like French or Italian. Phonology deals with the systematic organization of sounds within a language. We had a glimpse of this earlier when we introduced the structural approach of Ferdinand de Saussure, in which we saw the consonants laid out systematically in a table. The idea is that within a code like English, there are rules underlying the sequencing of sounds. There's an assumption here, an old assumption, that speech is made up of, by concatenating individual sound units, these are often called phonemes, which are a bit like letters, but you wouldn't know that reading English, which whose spelling is absolutely appalling, but in a well-behaved language, phonemes have a fairly regular correspondence to letters. But of course, they belong with the voice. And we, an analysis of the voice is not confined to languages which are written. So we can investigate this. We can ask ourselves, for example, do we have intuitions? We are English speakers. Um, can we tell the difference between a well-formed English word and a, a malformed English word? So there's four words, gross, glump, fif, and poink. As far as I'm aware, none of these are actually current English words. But if you evaluate them for their suitability, if we wanted a new word, well, scraw seems fine. It's not unlike some existing words like straw or scrap. Slump is ugly and difficult to say. It's got this stl sound at the beginning, which is um, not found in any other English word. So we'd have to say, yeah, that doesn't look like an English word. What about fifth? Well, Fifth isn't an English word. It is a German word. Uh, in English, we don't have pf as a cluster, currently. In German, they do. So this would be a fine German word, but not a fine English word. It looks like things are fairly black and white. Poink reminds us that things are not quite so simple. Poink may seem to you to be an acceptable English word, but if it is, it's got very few neighbors. Um, oink is a kid's word used to describe the sound a pig makes. I don't know if boink is a real word. Those are the only neighbors of this word. Uh, it's not just to do with rhymes. The um, sequencing of a diphthong, that's a vowel with movement like oi, with a nasal n and k, makes that a very complex syllable. Um, and so it's it's a, maybe a degree... A borderline case might be acceptable, might not be acceptable. That, that set of rules which are assumed to underlie the difference between sequences which are okay and sequences which are not within the confines of a code is called phonotactics. And on point, we've seen that maybe these rules are not 100% clear. Phonology usually uses... Um, a fixed set of assumptions, such as that speech is encoded in discrete units. Those are the phonemes. Um, and that there is a systematic relationship between the physical realization of speech as sound and its underlying sequence of units. Now, on this view of language that is taken within this generative world, elements of a language are contrastive. That is, you know it's a p because it's not a b or a t or a d. It occupies a place within a structure. Um, and linguistic information is then assumed to be categorical. That is, the information which is, strictly speaking, in this sense, linguistic, is information that distinguishes between categorically opposed units. And those are, there are many aspects of the speech signal that are don't lend themselves to this kind of analysis. So I might talk in a breathy voice, for example, and that's not expressible with these assumptions. 
uh, or I might speak really, really quickly. And that's not expressible. So that those are non-categorical aspects of the speech signal. But on these assumptions, we can go and play the game of phonology. And if you were taking a phonology class, which unfortunately you're not, here's the kind of exercise you might get. Um, there's a bunch of examples. These are all words in English. And they're all in the singular. Um, we might ask, we noted that you form a plural by adding something, a plural marker. Let's have a look at them. Well, lip has a plural lips. S, so s is the plural marker here. Rocks has a plural rocks. So s, s again. Tree has the plural trees. Z, that's a different sound. We had s for the first two, and now we've got z. So we've got at least two sounds. One we might write with the letter s, s, and one with the letter z, z. Latch has the plural latches, z. Mm, that's the third one. So now we've got three plural markers. And we can go through them. Um, and I won't bother doing it. We will find that there are three plural markers in English. There's s, z, and z. How do you know which one to use? Do you know which one to use? Well, yes, you do. I just gave you a new word, scraw, uh, and suggested that it looks like a fine English word. What's the plural of scraw? Scraws. Z. It's not scross, and it's not scraws. It's scraws. So I knew, without ever having met the plural, what the plural of scrawls was. So there's some kind of regularity underlying this. Now, how would, is that to be expressed? Well, by performing exercises like this, analyzing a lot of examples, we would eventually come to realize that the sound at the end of the word, which bears the plural, is going to be important. We will have learned to categorize those sounds, and we will have learned that uh, words which end in a vowel, like tree, for example, will always, or toe, will always take z. Words which end with a voiceless stop, like lip and rock, will always take s. Words which end with a complicated sound, like an, it's called an affricate, like ch, will always take z. And so we can learn to build up uh, rules which will tell us which um, plural marker is appropriate for which form. All that said, English is complex enough that there are further um, exceptions that have to be learned individually, like, for example, sheep, whose plural is sheep. The plural is just not marked. If that <clears throat> kind of exercise is to your taste, here's a little exercise you can try on your own. Some American dialects produce, pronounce these words different, some of these words differently from the way we pronounce them in Dublin. Uh, but some of these words are pronounced the same way. So if we go to New York, they don't call it New York in New York. They call it New York. So they say new where we say new. And if you go to listen to some music, where we listen to a tune, they listen to a tune. So this sound be before ooh sometimes changes. When do we say when when will we differ and when will we vary? Well, there's some examples. You can go through them yourself. Um, and what you'll find is that it's it's quite complicated. Um, nonetheless, of course, native speakers have no trouble with this. What you find is that the place in which the initial consonant is articulated matters, and if the initial consonant is articulated just behind the teeth then the pronunciation differs, and that's the case for tune and new. But it's not the case for cute, which is articulated further back, or pure, which is articulated further forward. You'd have to dig a little bit to find that out. It's not necessarily easy. So phonology becomes this game of finding these regularities underlying the sequencing of discrete, categorically opposed sounds. To that extent, it's about sound. Phonetics is also about sound, but now we're about to drop out of the rarefied world of generative linguistics back into the real world of context, situations, intentions, purposes, and we're going to deal with phonetics. Phonetics is also about sound, 
but it's about specifically the production, transmission and perception of speech. And so the phoneticians don't work with words on a page. They go out and stick microphones in people's faces and record sounds and look at the movements of the tongue and the movements of the lips. And to a phonetician, for example, the P at the start of the word pet is very different from the P at the end of the word tap. They are the same phony, that is, the, the P sound plays the same role, a uh, structural role, occupies the same structural position in the set of consonants of English, but they're pronounced quite differently. If I say pet, that P is released with a big burst and aspiration of air, whereas the P at the end of tap typically isn't. Um, so phonetics deals with this physical manifestation of speech. Um, there are hybrid disciplines. Laboratory phonology, for example, tries to figure out what phoneticians must measure in order to provide the phonologist with their discrete categorical units. Phoneticians tend to work with this kind of a representation of sound, that's a recording of a waveform which is being analyzed for its um, pitch, its intensity, the frequency makeup, and so on. So please don't confuse phonetics and phonology. Phonology belongs in the generative world with semantics, syntax, and morphology. It deals with idealized symbolic units that can be combined according to formal rules, as do semantics, syntax, and morphology. Phonetics deals with the real world. It's empirical. It deals with sounds, meat, spit, and ears. Both of them, to some extent, try to understand how language is made manifest in speech, but the practitioners of these disciplines don't necessarily construct that term language in the same way, which of course is now becoming a recurrent theme.